Hi, my name is Christian Hyde. I'm the Managing Director at Risk360, and I will oversee our ISO 27001 practice. And this is our ISO 27001 Explained series where we cover all 114 controls in ISO 27001 and try to provide some guidance to our listeners so you can understand if you want to get certified or if you want to implement a program, uh, you have some guidance there. So today we're talking about Control Objectives 9.3 around user responsibilities and 9.4 around system and application access control. This falls under the Control Objective 9 around overall access control. Um, in Control Objective 9.3, here on my, the left-hand side of my screen, this is uh, the ISO 27001 framework where it uh, spells out the 114 controls. And then today what I wanted to show on the right-hand side of my screen is an example of a RISC 360 policy that covers off on every aspect of these controls. If you're a RISC 360 client, you have access to our template policies here and then above and beyond that as part of ISO implementations we'll customize the strategy that goes into building a policy and as you'll see as we go through this there's some nuances that you would want to consider so let's cover off in each control uh, under control objective 9.3 there's only one control 9.3.1 and that's around use of secret authentication information and what that really translates into is what is the user's responsibility for secret authentication information, really meaning passwords or encryption keys, things like that. So on the right-hand side of my screen over here, you can see that we've written out policies for end-user responsibilities around passwords and authentications. So some of the things you might want to include is how should a user uh, treat a password? For example, they can't share it with a friend, they can't write it down, they can't put it on a sticky note. You also might want to specify password complexity requirements. Um, you, so you want to make sure that they keep those passwords confidential and they have good passwords. A lot of that stuff can be systematically enforced. So you can, for example, if you're using Active Directory or G Suite or 365, you can systematically enforce complex passwords that make this a lot easier. You can also uh, require individuals use something like a password management system like uh, Password One or LastPass. And you can see that's what we did exactly here in the, po uh, the policy. We talked about what password requirements look like and then the requirement to keep those passwords confidential. Again, if you're implementing this at your organization, you'll need to decide like what is that password policy, and it might vary from system to system, and how you plan on enforcing that password policy. So are you just going to tell people that they have to do it and expect them to adhere to those policies, or are you going to systematically um, through system configurations, make sure those password requirements are implemented. Now moving on to control objective 9.4 around system and application access control, there are five controls and we'll cover off on each one of these. 9.4.1 uh, is around information access restriction. So I'll move on to my policy here. So we're thinking about how do you um, restrict information? So this is a fairly generic um, uh, control, so what we just say is that access has to be restricted based on its data classification policy, based on how important that data is, based on, and you can implement that through um, where you store different data sets. So for example, if you have a file repo, you might store uh, sensitive data in one file where everyone doesn't have access, or one system where access is limited, and we kind of spell that out here through policy. This will largely be a policy control when you think about how an auditor is going to audit this, but it needs to be functionally implemented uh, throughout your organization. And we can move on to Control Objective 9.4.2 about secure logon procedures. These are literally the procedures that your organization will use to log on to systems. So some of the things you might uh, consider is if you are going to require username and passwords for every system. Which systems will require multi-factor authentication? Um, do some systems require a secure token or uh, some type of other secure logon procedure? You could also think about this in terms of physical access, if you have rooms that have keys or a safe with a lock, but that's not relevant for most organizations. Really what they're thinking about is those logon procedures by system, typically including a username, a password, and some type of multi-factor authentication. Again, those are um, there's two ways you can enforce those. You can enforce that via policy, where you just tell people that they have to do it and expect them to adhere to that. The stronger control is that you systematically enforce that. So, for example, if people are going to log on to Office 365 or G Suite or one of your secure applications, you enable a configuration setting that requires that user upon logon to uh, enable multi-factor authentication. 
Moving on to control 9.4.3 around password management system. Uh, this is where you describe what the expectations of password management systems are. Two ways to typically handle this. In all situations, you want to require that individuals keep their passwords confidential and safe. Um, that could be just by storing it in their mind or um, some other secure way like a, a last pass or one pass or something like that. Um, but just basically require they uh, keep it confidential and do not share it. The more technical way to um, control password management is by implementing some type of tool for password control. Again, good tools out there might be uh, uh, Password One or One Password and LastPass or something similar. They all have enterprise editions that you can roll out to the team. And a part of the strategy here might be that you don't want your every employee to have a password management tool. Maybe you have thousands of employees or hundreds of employees and it doesn't make sense to give everybody a, a tool like that. But at least your key users, for example, people who maybe have administrative access to systems or are uh, department heads, things like that, who you really want to help them control how they manage passwords, you might want to provision them some type of password management tool set to help them uh, go above and beyond just um, the blocking and tackling of keeping passwords safe. Um, one I do want to spend some time on is 9.4.4, uh, which was the use of privileged uh, utility programs. So this one's a difficult one because sometimes it's hard to understand what a privileged utility program is. And what ISO describes a privileged utility program is any type of program that would uh, aid a user in circumventing uh, security controls. So good examples of that is, for example, on your laptop, um, if a user can circumvent security controls by using your command line or PowerShell, or maybe they're installing some systems that helps them circumvent administrative or mobile device management controls on their endpoint, those those types of privileged utility programs would generally be uh, prohibited. The ways that you can prohibit utility programs would include uh, via policy, so you just prohibit them from doing it. So maybe technically they can, but you say you, you tell them that it's against policy to do that and you expect them to adhere to that. Again, the better way to do that is systematically. So you can, uh, for example, implement a mobile device management tool or other types of tools uh, on endpoint devices or on applications that prevent users from uh, doing anything that would help them bypass typical controls. You can also use uh, like uh, software prevention programs. So for example, uh, if a user is curious and they want to download uh, some pen test tools or they want to download some uh, freeware that ends up being something that bypasses typical, um, typical administrative settings on an application or system, you could blacklist those types of software using something like an uh, advanced anti-malware uh, tool or a mobile device management tool on your endpoints. So those are some of the strategy considerations you'd want to think through uh, by uh, prohibiting privileged utility programs. Uh, the last control in this section is control 9.4.5 or access control to program source code. We touched on uh, this a little bit in the last video. But when you think about source code and access to that, that's a, a key area. So access control can be thought of in domains. So you could think of access to your network, you think about access to SaaS platforms, access to infrastructure, etc. But one ISO specifically calls out is access to program source code. So a good example of that is if your engineering team is building a product, who has access to the source code? Um, that could be something like Subversion, or uh, GitHub or GitLab or whatever your source code repo is, who has access to make changes to that source code, who has access to promote it to production. If you're doing kind of a DevOps life cycle and you can merge branches, who has access to the source code orchestration? And those are all really good examples of how you might control access to program source code. Any SaaS tool you're using, any enterprise application is typically gonna have, have roles and you wanna think through uh, what type of user at your organization belongs in which type of role. And then for those high-risk areas like source code, it might even mirror a separate policy or a procedure that your engineering team would keep, for example, that would define what type of user um, is allowed to have what type of access, and then make sure that you're implementing that access. And then you would tie all this back to user <laughs> access reviews, onboarding, offboarding, etc., to make sure that you're actually implementing all the controls that you're setting. So that is uh, 
control of depth was 9.3 and 9.4 and the accompanying policy here. If you found this helpful, uh, you can always get help from the RISC 360 team. We can come up with a customized strategy to implement these type of policies. Um, we have a lot of videos on this topic that you can continue to watch. And you can always visit us at risk360.com and we're happy to help.